In November of 2013, South Carolina man David Adam Pate went into the woods of Lancaster County with 33-year-old Ricky James. Pate, whom sources described as a white supremacist, reportedly lured James, a black man, to a secluded location by telling him they were going to get drunk on wine. Once there, Pate, who was at the time in his early 20s, attacked James with a large knife. He would later tell his mother that he'd enjoyed killing the victim, whom he stabbed at least three dozen times. James's decomposed body was found by local children playing in the area. Lancaster County Sheriff Barry Fail told the media that his office had suspected Pate almost immediately, and their suspicions were confirmed by lab results of crime scene samples. By then, Pate was already in custody following an arrest for disorderly conduct. While his processing photo was being taken, Pate displayed his split tongue, and the photo also showed his tattoos, which included the word Satan above his eyebrow and the number 974 on his neck, marking his affiliation with insane gangster disciple Street Gang. Pate confessed to the killing and in one of his recorded police interviews blamed the victim, telling detectives, it was his fault. Why would anyone go drinking and go into the woods with someone who looks like me? Pate also told the police that the butcher knife with which he'd killed James was just like the one Michael Myers used. Referring to the antagonist in the Halloween slasher movie, at his home, the police found 20 more knives, some bought and others homemade, as well as 20 masks. Pate also claimed that he'd covered James's body because he'd intended to kill another person in the same place. During the sentencing hearing in 2015, the victim's brothers described Pate as the devil, and he was ultimately sentenced to life without parole. Number 6. Tamel Esco an unnamed 67-year-old Filipino woman was about to enter her apartment in Yonkers on March the 11th of 2022 when Tamel Esco crept up behind her. 42-year-old Esco had no connection with the woman aside from the fact that they lived in the same building. The man punched her in the head, knocking her to the ground. In a savage attack that was captured on surveillance cameras, Esco struck the cowering woman over a hundred times, alternating between fists. He called her racial slurs and ended the onslaught by stomping on her face repeatedly until she went limp and spitting on her. Police arrived to find the bloodied victim in the vestibule and Esco standing outside. The victim, a widow and a mother of two, was taken to a local hospital in stable condition. She suffered cuts to her head and face, multiple facial bone fractures and a brain bleed. Esco, who was a career criminal, who'd previously spent time in prison for assault and criminal sale of a controlled substance. In 2021, he'd thrown a woman through the glass window of a salon, but reportedly only received a conditional discharge. For the attack on the Asian woman, he was charged with attempted murder as a hate crime. There was widespread outrage regarding the incident and Yonkers Police Commissioner Christopher Sapienza called it one of the most violent and one of the most heinous crimes he'd ever witnessed in his 27 years on the force. Reading her impact statement in court, the victim stated that she prayed to God during the attack to keep her alive for her daughter's sake. Fearing for her life, she left her home of over two decades in the aftermath. In September of 2022, Esco pleaded guilty to first-degree assault as a hate crime and in November, he was sentenced to 17 and a half years in prison. Number 5. Anna Montgomery Transgender woman Anna Montgomery was on a Saturday night out with her boyfriend, Jamie Gavan, in September of 2020. They'd just finished dining in the city centre of Belfast, Northern Ireland, when 20-year-old Montgomery was suddenly assaulted at her table. A pub goer struck her in the face and the hit caused a cut on Montgomery's forehead and damage to her nose. She later posted photos of her face with blood dripping down on it. Talking to the media in the aftermath, Montgomery described the attack as sly and sneaky, adding that she'd never felt more humiliated. Local police treated the incident as a hate crime, but it wasn't made immediately clear if they'd identified the person responsible. Number 4. Nicole Franklin In the summer of 2021, Iowa woman Nicole Franklin, who also went by the surname Poole, 
was sentenced to concurrent sentences totaling 25 years after pleading guilty to two federal counts of violating the U.S. Hate Crime Act and two state counts of attempted murder. On the afternoon of December the 9th of 2019, she mounted a sidewalk with her Jeep Grand Cherokee in Des Moines and struck a boy whom she believed was of Middle Eastern or African descent. Franklin later told law enforcement that she thought the black preteen was the member of an extremist group who wanted to take her out. The victim suffered minor leg injuries. Roughly 30 minutes later, Franklin drove onto the sidewalk again in Clive and hit teenager Natalia Miranda. The teen, who'd been walking towards her school to watch a basketball game, suffered severe bruising and a concussion. She was hospitalized for two days but was set to make a full recovery, a turn of events which doctors described as a miracle. The police suspected that Miranda had spent roughly 15 minutes unconscious on the ground before she regained her senses and stumbled towards her school for help. 41-year-old Franklin was tracked down and arrested later that same day and admitted that she'd struck the girl intentionally because she was of Latin descent. Speaking of the teen, the middle-aged woman said she was taking over our homes and our jobs and wasn't supposed to be in our country. Speaking during her sentencing, Miranda's father addressed Franklin directly and told her, I hope you change because human beings can never live like this. Around the time of Franklin's arrest for the vehicle attacks, she was separately charged with assault in violation of individual rights and with operating under the influence, a second offense. The charge stemmed from her going to a convenience store where she threw items as a clerk and launched a verbal tirade latched with racial epithets at him and his customers. Number 3. Joseph Borgen Incident In May of 2021, New York City accountant Joseph Borgen was on his way to a pro-Israel rally in Times Square while wearing a kippah. A pro-Palestine demonstrator wearing a black bandana started chasing him. While trying to get away, Borgen was surrounded by a crowd of demonstrators who brutally attacked him. Video would show him defenseless on the ground in the fetal position outside of 1604 Broadway. The mob punched and kicked Borgen, hit him with crutches and poles, and pepper sprayed him for what he estimated was a minute straight throughout the savage attack. The mob shouted anti-Semitic slurs at the victim. He survived and several days later posted photos showing him with a neck brace and the various injuries he'd sustained. In an interview, the man claimed he thought he was going to die. Several of his attackers were subsequently arrested, including 24-year-old Wasim Awada, who had been recorded hitting Borgen with crutches. Following his arrest, Awada repeatedly told officers that he would do it again. He faced up to seven years in prison but was offered a deal in which he pleaded guilty to second-degree attempted assault as a hate crime and criminal possession of a weapon for which he was sentenced to 18 months in jail. During his sentencing in June of 2023, Borgen read a victim impact statement criticizing the deal. He claimed that he wanted to see full justice and had been prepared to go to trial while also noting that the deal sent the wrong message to all victims of hate crimes. Faisal Elizai, another of his attackers, pleaded guilty to attempted assault in the third degree as a hate crime and was sentenced to three years probation. Three other defendants, Mohammed Othman, Mohammed Saeed Othman and Mahmoud Musa had cases pending against them as of the latest updates. Today's topic was requested by Matthew Monsebais, 2138, and Kaimeraga 6146. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 2. James Craig Anderson Incident In 2015, Mississippi woman Shelby Brooke Richards and Sarah Adelia Graves, both in their early 20s, were sentenced to eight and five years in prison, respectively, for their roles in a series of hate crimes against black residents in Jackson, culminating in the murder of James Craig Anderson. A central figure in the latter incident was 18-year-old Daryl Paul Dedman. On June the 26th of 2011, along with the two women, he rallied a group of young white men and women, mostly hailing from Mississippi suburbs, with the express purpose of attacking black people. The group used two vehicles, a Jeep Cherokee and Dedman's Ford F-250 truck, 
Upon reaching Jackson at around 5 a.m., those in the former vehicle spotted 47-year-old James Craig Anderson in the parking lot of the Metro Inn. He was trying to get into his car after losing his keys and the group reportedly thought he was in the process of stealing the vehicle. The teens in the Jeep contacted Deadman, who joined them in the parking lot. Both Richards and Graves would later admit to encouraging Deadman to attack Anderson. He and others in the group proceeded to viciously beat and rob the man while yelling out racial slurs and white power. The Jeep drove away from the scene, but the Ford remained behind. Richards and Graves, who were in their teens at the time, would also later admit that in the moments that followed the vicious beating, they'd encouraged Deadman to run Anderson over. The hotel's surveillance cameras showed the truck backing up and then accelerating towards the victim as he staggered at the edge of the parking lot. Deadman's headlights briefly illuminated Anderson's shirt before he disappeared under the truck. The teenager sped away from the scene and subsequently referred to the victim using a slur while boasting about running him over. Anderson succumbed to his injuries within days of the incident. Richard subsequently lied to the police about the circumstances surrounding the attack and her participation in it. On July the 6th, Deadman was arrested on the charge of capital murder as a racially motivated hate crime. The FBI subsequently began investigating the death as a civil rights violation and discovered that from 2012 to 2014, a total of 10 individuals had conspired to commit hate crimes against members of Jackson's African-American population. They included shooting at black residents with slingshots or throwing bottles at them, an attempt to run over a man who was able to jump out of the vehicle's path, and the brutal beatdown of a man near a golf course to the point that he begged for his life. Richards and Graves had also taken part in another trip to Jackson, in which their group had assaulted a man who tried to sell them drugs. The 10 perpetrators charged with federal hate crimes and conspiracy included those that had attacked Anderson. All pleaded guilty. They received sentences that varied from 4 to 18 years in federal prison, with the exception of Deadman, who admitted murder and was given two concurrent life sentences. The victim's family had reportedly asked that he be spared the death penalty. During a court appearance in March of 2012, Deadmond apologized to Anderson's family, stating, I was young, I was dumb, I was ignorant, I was not raised the way that I acted that night. We have our earlier release on when grudges go wrong, coming up for you right after number one. Stay tuned if you haven't seen that one yet. Number one. Peyton Gendron On May the 14th of 2022, teenager Peyton Gendron traveled roughly 200 miles from his home in Conklin, New York to a Topps supermarket located in a predominantly black neighborhood in Buffalo. 18-year-old Gendron was armed with a Bushmaster XM-15 assault rifle, modified for high-capacity magazines in addition to having a shotgun and a hunting rifle in his car. He wore body armor and a military-style helmet on which a camera was mounted that was live-streaming on Twitch. Gendron opened fire from the parking lot, hitting four people and killing three. Once inside the supermarket, he shot eight people, six of whom died. Armed security guard Aaron Salter shot Gendron, but his armor caught the bullet and the latter returned fire, killing the guard. All of the mass shooter's deceased victims, ranging in age from 32 to 86, were black. At one point, Gendron took aim at a white person behind the counter but didn't shoot and apologized. Patrol officers convinced Gendron to surrender as he emerged from the store. The FBI investigated the attack as a hate crime and an act of racially motivated violent extremism. It would emerge that Gendron had started planning the attack in January of 2022. Prior to carrying out physical recognizance at Tops, he'd researched the neighborhood in Buffalo with the highest percentage of black residents and then at what time of the day the supermarket was the busiest. An online manifesto tied to Gendron revealed that he followed the white genocide conspiracy theory and the great replacement theory of Renaud Camus, which essentially claims that global elites plan to systematically replace white people with non-whites. Most of the ideology in the manifesto had been plagiarized while the author expressed support for other racially motivated mass shooters like Dylan Roof and Brenton Tarrant. The Tops mass shooting had reportedly been set to unfold on March the 15th, on the anniversary of the Christchurch mosque shootings perpetrated by Tarrant. 
Gendron reportedly intended to conduct further attacks as part of his overall agenda to terrorize all non-white, non-Christian people and get them to leave the country. In June of 2022, Gendron was charged with 26 counts of federal hate crimes, as well as additional gun charges. In November, he pleaded guilty to all of the state's charges against him, and in February of 2023, he was sentenced to 11 consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. Number 6. Joseph James Pappas on July the 20th of 2018, heart surgeon Mark Hausknecht was riding his bike while heading to work at the Texas Medical Center in Houston. The 65-year-old physician who in the past had treated U.S. President George W. Bush Sr. was followed by a second biker for several miles. As the latter passed him at around 9 a.m., he turned around and opened fire on Hausknecht before riding away. The doctor was hit in the head and torso, sustaining injuries from which he was pronounced dead at Ben Taub Hospital. The shooting was captured by a Metro bus camera, and its exceedingly deliberate and unprovoked nature puzzled investigators for days. A woman then called the police, claiming that her neighbor resembled the suspect in the footage. He was identified as 62-year-old Joseph James Pappas, a former deputy constable who was described as an expert marksman. The authorities contacted a family friend from whom they learned that Pappas had threatened to take his life in text messages. He'd also sent the deed for his house and title of his vehicle to the aforementioned friend's mother, claiming he had a terminal illness. A search of his nearly empty Westbury home revealed a last will and testament, as well as a file he'd collected on house next job, home and routines, which confirmed that he was his killer. The police eventually tracked Pappas down in Houston and, as the bulletproof vest-clad suspect was approached by two officers, he fatally shot himself in the head with a 22 caliber snub-nosed revolver. The motive for the killing, which had eluded investigators at first, was revealed to have been a grudge of over two decades that Pappas had held against Hausneck. Its origins were traced back to 1997, when his mother had died on the cardiologist's operating table, but it wasn't clear why Pappas had targeted him so long after her passing. Number 5. Caitlin Conley 60-year-old Mary Yoda, the owner of a chiropractic clinic in Whitesboro, New York, unexpectedly passed away on July the 22nd of 2015. A few days earlier, she'd been perfectly healthy, but during the 48 hours leading up to her death, she was in severe pain from what was initially believed to have been a stomach virus. The woman was mourned by her family and those with whom she had a working relationship, including her receptionist, Caitlin Conley. The latter paid tribute to Mary on Facebook the day after her passing through a moving post which began with, if love could have saved you, you would have lived forever. Conley, then in her early 20s, was involved in what was described as an on-again, off-again romantic relationship with Mary's son, Adam. The woman's death was ultimately deemed suspicious and, upon further examination of her body, it was determined that she'd been fatally poisoned with a drug called Colchicine, used to treat gout. Her husband and son were the initial persons of interest with the potential motives of an extramarital love interest for the former and inheritance for the latter. Then, in November of 2015, the Oneida County Sheriff's Office received an anonymous letter that indicated a vial of culture sign could be found under the passenger seat of Adam's Jeep. He allowed law enforcement to search his vehicle and was bewildered when the container turned up as the letter had stated. His alibi, however, was solid as he'd been visiting family in Long Island during the time frame of his mother's poisoning. Attention ultimately turned to Conley when investigators learned that her sporadic relationship with Adam had been fraught and tensed. A theory began to take shape that Conley held a grudge against him and that she'd poisoned Mary to hurt someone he loved. It was suspected she'd spiked a protein shake her boss drank daily. The young woman admitted to having written the letter during her interviews with detectives and claimed she feared Adam. However, the purchase of the culture sign was traced to Conley. Her online activity indicated she'd researched the most lethal poisons and her DNA was found on the vial taken from Adam's Jeep. She maintained her innocence but was eventually found guilty of first-degree manslaughter and sentenced to 23 years in prison. Number 4. Walter Moody on May the 7th of 1972, Hazel Moody opened a package she'd found in the kitchen of her Georgia home and it immediately exploded in front of her. 
The woman survived the blast but was left with extensive injuries to her hand, thigh, shoulder, and eye, which had been struck by scrap metal. The package she'd opened contained a pipe bomb that her husband, Walter, then in his late 30s, had allegedly intended to send to an auto dealer who'd repossessed his car. Moody was found not guilty of making the bomb but guilty of possessing it and sentenced to five years in Atlanta State Penitentiary. Moody's hatred of the justice system steadily began to build during his incarceration and after his release. He'd gone to law school but couldn't practice due to his criminal conviction, which the Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit refused to overturn. The grudge he harbored was translated into murderous action in December of 1989 when Moody sent out four mail bombs. One package arrived at the home of federal judge Robert Vance in Mountain Brook, Alabama. He proceeded to open it on December the 16th and was killed instantly in the blast, while his wife was severely injured. Two days later, black civil rights attorney Robert Robinson died in a similar explosion at his office in Savannah, Georgia. Two other packages were intercepted and diffused, one sent to 11th Circuit Court's headquarters in Atlanta and another to the office of Willie Dennis, president of the NAACP branch in Jacksonville, Florida. An extensive investigation identified Moody as a culprit and he was arrested with his second wife, Susan. She agreed to testify against him in exchange for immunity. Investigators determined that only the 11th Circuit Court and Vance had been targets valued by Moody. The other two packages Moody had sent were meant to distract and make it seem like the bombings had been racially motivated. He was sentenced to death and the punishment was carried out via lethal injection in April of 2018 when Moody was 83 years old. Number 3. Alexander Palmer On August the 5th of 2017, pensioner Peter Wrighton was walking his two dogs in woodland known as The Heath near East Harlem, England. During the day out, a knifeman approached 83-year-old Wrighton from behind and began stabbing him relentlessly. Passers-by stumbled upon the man's lifeless body hidden under brambles and alerted the authorities. The police found that his head had nearly been severed from his body and discovered further injuries inflicted with such brutality that they'd initially believed Wrighton had been mauled by a wild animal. A murder investigation was eventually launched, but the authorities struggled to identify a suspect in what appeared to have been a random killing. A psychologist then pointed them in the direction of ex-army commando Alexander Palmer, aged 24. The medical specialist had treated him at RAF Mahan, where Palmer had told staff he heard a voice in his head called Little Alex with a particular hatred towards dog walkers. The voice reportedly urged Palmer to stab and kill them. The police tracked his personalized license plate L666AHP to the area of the attack. During the ensuing police interviews, Palmer was asked about the number, a reputed mark of Satan, and joked that he was a little devil. He admitted being in the area but denied killing Wrighton. During his case's legal proceedings, the prosecution argued that him being in the Woodlands vicinity was no coincidence and said that little Alex appears to have some ill feeling or a grudge towards dog walkers. During his talks with mental health staff, Palmer had claimed that when he eventually hurt someone, that his victim would likely be chosen at random. It only took a jury 44 minutes to find Palmer guilty at Nottingham Crown Court and he was sentenced to life with a minimum of 28 years served. Number 2. David Hall On Father's Day 2018, a man was gunned down in Brooklyn following a months-long dispute over a parking space. 46-year-old David Hall had been nursing a grudge against William Fernandez, aged 33, since the younger man had taken what he'd claimed as his spot back in January. It was a public parking space on Forest Street in Bushwick, where Hall lived with his wife and two children. The two men had a heated verbal exchange and nearly came to blows. Hall's animosity towards Fernandez increased in the months that followed when he found that his vehicle's tires had been slashed and he came to suspect that the latter had been responsible. Roughly six months after their initial clash, Hall confronted Fernandez while armed with a handgun. After chasing him around the neighborhood, he fired at him seven times and a bullet struck the man in the back. He suffered critical damage to his heart and lung, from which he died at Wyckoff Hospital just hours away from spending Father's Day with his four children. 
Hall remained on the run for roughly three weeks but ultimately surrendered to the police at the 83rd Precinct. He was subsequently convicted of second degree murder and sentenced to 20 years to life in prison. Number 1. Jiang Kao Kao In 1996, Chinese man Jiang Kao Kao, aged 13 at the time, witnessed his mother being beaten to death by Wang Zheng Jun, then in his late teens. It was the brutal culmination of a long-standing feud between Jiang and Wang's families, who lived in a village in the southwest of the Shanxi province. Following a dispute, the woman has struck Wang in the face with a piece of metal before the teenager dealt the fatal blow with a wooden bat. Upon considering his age and the active role Jiang's mother had had in the conflict, the authorities sentenced Wang to seven years in prison. There were no more conflicts between the two families, but over the course of the two decades that followed, Jiang was consumed by a grudge that affected his job, lifestyle, and mental health. Then on February the 15th of 2015, he learned that 40-year-old Wang would be returning to the village for the celebration of the Spring Festival. A few days later, on the eve of the Lunar New Year, Jiang ambushed the man and his brother, 46-year-old Xiao Jun. He knifed them both to death shortly after they'd come back from paying tribute to their ancestors. Jiang then went to the home of their father, Zi Xing, aged 70, and fatally stabbed him as well, before setting their family car ablaze. Two days later, Jiang turned himself into the police and was subsequently given the death penalty. In July of 2019, the Supreme People's Court in Shanxi announced that he'd been executed. Jiang's capital punishment received mixed reactions on the Weibo social media platform, where some praised him for being a real man and avenging his mother, while others condemned the triple murder and saw the punishment as befitting. Thanks for watching. Would you rather be charged with a hate crime or become the victim of one? Let us know in the comments section below.